Alright, should be recording. This is kind of a second to try at this video, unfortunately. I uh, had a little bit of a computer failure. It's, such things happen. Anyway, so, yes, uh, well, you know, just forgot to save the video, that's all. And then I, <laughs> yeah, that's all I did. Yeah, I forgot to save it, and then uh, I rebooted it. Can't save it after you reboot. So, anyway. Um, Alright, so the Robert Ritchie guy did make another video, um, and, um, you know, conceding some of the argument, and, um, you know, it's all, you gotta be kind of careful how you slice things with words, because people just keep playing with each other's words. So, in that vein, um, there was some idiot commenters, there's some apparently new troll video, um, again, I'm not going to watch the videos if they're just garbage, so if you can't make a rational argument. But apparently, you know, it just has my voice way speeded up. Uh, but it doesn't even reference the exact subject that's being talked about. It's just so useless. And then just puts a laugh track on it, like, yeah, right, you win the argument with a laugh track. Like, I mean, what the fuck? People are just such idiots. Um, let's see. So... Um, inflammation. Oh, this is some sort of joint inflammation stuff here. Guy should eat broccoli to fix my back, which you know, it's fine. You people can have all your little holistic bullshit. I have a herniated disc. If you're not gonna fix it with a piece of broccoli, <laughs> you know, it's, it's carrying newspapers when I was a kid for seven years. Big mistake. Uh, and then restaurant trays and all that crap and. Uh, but whatever, you're not going to fix it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just, just, I mean, you see this everywhere in life, right? I mean, it's, it's again, people want pretty and simple answers. They want answers to be the answer that means they have power, and they want the answer that says, um, you know, that it's simple. Um, and they just don't, you know, the truth is just. Eh. <laughs> you know, and you see that, you know, there's just people with their magical health cures and then people with their magical energy sources. And um, it just seems like that's where people gravitate with uh, a propensity. Uh, yeah, which has me thinking about different subjects. So I talked about quite a few subjects in the other video, but I thought of another one. And this just reminds me of it, so I guess I'll do this one first. I was thinking about the Lorenz contraction, you know, which is the silly line sort of, you know, the, you know, instead of a straight line on a graph, Lorenz just basically turns time dilation and contractions and all this other stuff into this silly line where everything happens over here and nothing happens all this time. And I thought of a principle that illustrates that, but I don't know if it's actually consistent with the Lorenz contraction, because that's sort of a mathematical gimmick. But this would be one also as a probability um, question. So I was thinking about a needle in a haystack. And um, what if you start off with all needles and then it converted into hay? And then, you know, so you could sort of think that, you know, even when it was, even when the haystack was 50 50, it's going to be pretty easy to stick your finger in and find a needle. You know, and then even when there's only 30% needles, it's still going to be pretty easy to hit a needle. Um, and it's not going to get hard to hit a needle, you know, until you start getting pretty thinner and thinner and thinner. But it wouldn't be a Lorenz contraction. It'd be some other kind of slopey, be some other kind of slopey thing, I think. Um, just because 50-50 does seem pretty easy. So... I guess there has to be some time variant, you know, where it, you really are just doing something simple like poking your finger in. Because obviously by the end, if there's only one needle in the whole haystack, just poking your finger in isn't going to have much chance at all of hitting that needle, especially after all the outside needles have already been hit. Um, so I'd say the reality is something like that, um, in the sense that, that you have already have the kind of notion that I've provided anyway, that... Um, as something speeding up, you know, most of its energy is moving in one direction, and you need to hit a piece of energy moving in the opposite direction. And it would clearly take you a much longer time to find a piece of energy moving the right way. 
Um, or you might not hit one at all. You know, you go right through the thing and you'll never hit it. So I think that analogy sort of fits with this analogy. It'd be like hitting the needle in the haystack by just sticking a steel rod through the haystack. You know, you're going to have to do it an awful lot of times before you finally hit the needle. Uh, <clears throat> and so I think that's the real, there's no absolute prohibition against hitting the last needle. It's just that the odds are very thin. Uh, but there is a real last needle where the Lorentz contraction implies an infinity. So infinities in physics should just be sort of frowned upon. Like, um, you know, you do have something wrong with your, your model when it's doing something infinitely. Um, I think, <clears throat> uh, you know, it, it should be avoided. I'm just saying some, some infinities you can't avoid, but I'm just saying some, if you can avoid it, you're probably, it's probably a good idea to avoid it because it's not going to get you anywhere good. All right, so this is sort of relates uh, you know, uh, indirectly. So some asshole, um, you know, they, they did spam his comment, so I didn't see it. You know, it wasn't in the regular comments. I thought that maybe it's still in the spam folder. I don't know. I, I just blocked him because I just said this is garbage. He's posting links to garbage. Uh, you know, irrelevance. So he posted the stupid troll video as a response to somebody else's comment. It's not on the same subject. It's just so fucking rude. So yeah, you're just going to get blocked for that, and usually if you get blocked, I won't even be able to read your comment. So it's just fucking stupid. Um, and some other thing called a teen woot. You know, another asshole comment. Doesn't say anything here. But I guess I might as well... See, look at all this. I'm not going to waste my time with this. I already have an agenda, actually. Okay, so I have two problems with your theory. You know, well, I have a big problem with your fucking attitude. Like I said, I, you know, allow yourself to be uh, exposed to the same mockery, okay? So make a video with your face so I can record it, you know, and, and pervert it and then put laugh tracks on it and put you, you know, licking your own ass and shit. You know, p p paint a little, you know, penis hat for you to wear. I mean, you know, okay, just play fair, asshole. If you're, gonna, if you're just going to be a comic... All right, let me comic on you, asshole. Uh, you're just such a fucking uh, weak little pussy. You, know, you don't want to play by the same rules? You don't want to fight by the same fucking rules? You little pussy? Um, I like it, and I think it has potential. Fuck you in the ass till dead, you lying piece of sack of shit. Uh, but there are some issues that may need to be addressed. Yeah, fuck you. And pardon me if these have already been addressed in previous video or 20. Yeah, that's right. There's there's a thousand videos, actually, so it's not 20. and But I do have them in some sort of organization on the channel page in playlists. And the other ones say, start here, for example, fuckhead. <laughs> yeah. All right. Firstly, if you are in space, spaceship, which for the sake of argument is, well, why would I make a spaceship as long as one second of light? Wow. Very interesting. How far light travels in one second. Um, and it's traveling half the speed of light. Then it takes two seconds to cover its distance. So, suppose you shoot a laser from the back down the length of the ship. So, I, I probably should just save this for a separate video and we'll do this stupid bullshit over and over and over again. Like I said, we have gone over this 4,000 times. Um, and it does get complicated, as I just pointed out with this stupid asshole, who's probably the one responsible for the video, about the sound argument. Sound is a, it, it, the, the, the redshift argument. It's a little bit complicated, because just as I pointed out with the needle in the haystack, the idea is, is that when something's moving, it means it, it's already biased. There's less needles in its haystack. So when something's going to interact with something that's moving, it's going to take it longer to interact with it because it's got to hit a needle. It's got to find a needle to reflect off of. So I already just made a video on this subject. And it, obviously, it's, it's like I said, you people want to just make it simple. You want to make everything brick walls, and so everything's a Pong game. Well, it's not a game of Pong, okay? It's a more complicated than that. When a photon has to be created, and when an object's moving the speed of light, you might be able to, under, or half the speed of light, you might be able to understand that the mechanism that has to make the photon the, that is, the, 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 the electron has to move in a forward direction and then have a, 
uh, then, then have a decrease in its velocity. I mean, you know, you don't even know how photons are made, and yet you know how flashlights work at, at half the speed of light. Do you see how you're just being such a cheater? All right, so we'll deal with this subject in some separate video because, I, you know, I mean, I could do that one now, but this, you know, I'd rather do the one I intended to do, which is more about photons in other circumstances. So the Robert Ritchie guy did make a video. I'm just saying that look, you know, trolls. You're not. If I don't even watch your video, are you really succeeding? I mean, don't you want to make your video at least uh, so I can at least stomach watching it? <sighs> yeah. Anyway. So um, anyway, so so he's conceding that photons are photons are photons are photons. That is the whole uh, electromagnetic spectrum is photons um, but he's still calling them waves and just the whole EM thing okay electromagnetic so I've pointed over, out over and over again there's no evidence that photons are at all influenced by electro or magnetic because they are the force themselves <laughs> that's what they are they create electro and magnetic the photons do the bits do the energy does so they can't play both roles um, you know they can't be the force and then be affected by a force or be created by a force they are the force and they're not electric and magnetic as I'm trying to point out they're you could call them electron energy and proton energy or you could call them plus and minus or you could call them north and south energy but that's what they are. They're not electric and magnetic energy. They're a combination of a polarized. They're a mixture of a polarized energy. And how much the mixture is balanced between north and south decides what the energy is capable of doing to something it hits. All right, so I'll let him say this a little bit because, you know, this history thing is always a trouble. Uh, photons travel at the velocity of light. And uh, I think it was uh, Oliver Heaviside, based on Maxwell's equations. So again, going back to Maxwell and Heaviside, in my opinion, is just going back to a wrong start uh, in some sense. They obviously didn't know what we know now. Um, so, you know, some of what they engineered wasn't perfect, just like the first toilet wasn't brilliant. So it takes a little while to figure out how to do it right. And everybody's just stopping with the outhouse and saying there we've that's good enough and it's just not really the right thing to do where he derived uh, this formula here and that depends on uh... so we have these two stupid made-up numbers all right permutivity of empty space and permutivity of empty space epsilon zero and mu zero mu zero mu zero um, they're just made up numbers. They're constants. They were never, they were never tested. There was never a test, an experiment done to go find out how permeable space was. You can even just hear from the words. It doesn't make any sense. Clearly, these people who wrote this crap thought there was an ether. And so that's why they use terminology like that. And, but it just has nothing to do with anything because basically they were already the, the 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 constants weren't predicted the constants were necessary to make their equations balance so they were basically already having to declare the speed of light they just didn't know that's what they were doing and the two numbers always follow each other in the equation they use one of them for the permute for, for look they're renaming them right now and what are they calling them they're calling them the electric constant and the magnetic constant. So you can sort of get the idea that that's all they were from the very beginning. And as I'm pointing out uh, in the equations, there's there, they always just say, well, the B field is zero, but they always carry the epsilon zero with it, like it exists, even though it has no contribution. So the equations are both basically um, uh, counting both effects and they just say well one effects is zero in case and then so when something's magnetic they say the electric effect field of flux is zero but they still carry the the mu zero with it you know I don't know which constant is which but you know it's not but they're not real numbers they're they were made up they were made up just to balance equations 
They're just invented constants. They didn't predict the speed of light. Okay. <laughs> They, they predicted that, the, the like I said, their equations can't work if they don't know the right speed of the force. So obviously having the right speed of the force is important to the equations, and that's why those two numbers exist. But they never measured these quantities. This, the permittivity and permeability in free space, and uh, permittivity is the ability of the substance to store electrical energy in an electric... Right, but that's not what it is. So, so again, I'm just saying, <laughs> there's no substance in space, clearly. Obviously, space can store nothing. So this is all kind of a, a, a moot conversation. It really just has to do with the speed of light in the end. That's all the constants we're really representing was how much crap can you get to something in how much time. So it really just has to do with it. When you're transmitting the force, there's clearly a lag between the time the, the coil energizes and the wire can start absorbing the energy. There's a certain amount of time it's going to take. And it's not about the permutivity of space or anything else. Um, it's just about the fact that it's going to take time because the force does have a, a, a speed. All right, so I don't think I have to really beat this one to death. But... Um, yeah, so he's really stuck on this idea that light's a wave, and um, to me it's, you know, it's just notionally wrong. I don't know how exactly to convince him that there's no mechanism for this extra motion. Um, there's no, and again, there's just no evidence anywhere where photons land in some sort of, with some sort of, wave to them. Waves spread, these things don't. It doesn't make any sense. There's no correlate. There's nothing you can imagine in the real world we see that looks anything like what a photon's supposed to do. It's just nothing. And, and there should be similarities. There should be some, like I said, atoms don't look like galaxies. They're not, they're not a direct correlation, but there is some connection in terms of function. And this idea that you're just, you know, you're going to invent something that can do all of this complex motion and yet be the simplest, dumbest thing in the universe, it just doesn't make much sense, does it? I mean, every bit of the math sort of indicates it starts at point A, it lands at point B, and it does it in a straight line. And that's, that's what the evidence indicates. It doesn't indicate that it does it in some funky manner. And clearly there's no evidence that it is at all influenced by magnetism or electricity in its travel. All right. So that's probably enough of that. Uh, I'll take a little break. I'm tired already. Anyway. Yeah, I just want to say something life sucks. I mean, you know, it's not horrible, but it's just irritating as hell. All right, again, just pointing out that you can, you can perfectly visualize photons as little bullets, and it'll work, except for this stupid two-slit experiment. And it only doesn't work for that because no one will allow you to explain how the substance the bullets are flying through, which is the transition layer between the surfaces, is a complex substance, and that's why the bullets are being deflected. <laughs> okay, so it does work, they just won't let you, because we're not allowed to consider the matter that the photons are moving next to as influencing the experiment, because we're supposed to think the matter is like a table, and you can, you know, it doesn't have any structure. You know, it's just some sort of flat thing. Surfaces are all flat on the, on the tiny universe. There's just a bunch of tables that things could bounce off of. Well, anyway. Um, all right, so uh, I'll get to now the... Some, I know there's interferometer stuff in here that I wanted to get to. And, um, uh, yeah, so I had a few subjects. Oh, damn it, which order to take them in? Uh, well, we'll just start with the drawing table and see where we go. All right, so in the last video to to the Robert guy, um, I said something about long wave and short wave radio, and 
so I, I, I'm not sure that I corrected myself in terms of what I was stating. And clearly, um, the long wave radio doesn't reflect. It <clears throat> is more likely to be converted actually into sound. So I don't know what kind of good analogy would be, but it's you can sort of imagine that if the sunrise was coming up and the sun went down and it popped back up and it went down and popped back up, you know that that energy hitting the earth would have like a ringing sound and everything. Everything would kind of jiggle a little bit. And so it would be kind of a sound that would be produced even though it's photons. The photons would move things. The That little bit of movement would be converted to the atoms and vibrations in the atoms, but they wouldn't be converted into the polarization you need to create electricity. And um, we know that the electricity can then reconvert the energy back into photons. So a way of thinking about light transmitting through glass, frankly, is to think of it that way, that the photons hit the surface are in, in fact converted into electricity, <laughs> in a sense, and then they're remade back into photons at the other end, at the other side. Um, because the two kinds of energy are the, the, the same in the sense that it's just pressure moving through something. Um, an amount of these little bits that are creating pressure between electrons and then the electrons vibrate and they move this stuff along. All right, so that was part of the conversation was, you know, the stuff I've already gone over about, you know, the electrons aren't really going anywhere. They're just being pushed. And the push could just be in an up and down direction. It can be lots of different ways. The atom polarizes by either getting a little bigger or getting a little smaller. So when it's this way, it's a, a positive ion. When it's a little bigger, it's a negative ion in terms of the fact that it's holding or not. It's either holding pressure or has less pressure than the neutral condition. Um, and that's how electricity cascades. So electricity can't move unless it has unless it has a connection, right? The high pressure atoms are here. They need for for an atom to exchange, it needs to have a difference. But that's all that's really happening is this one guy saying, I have too much pressure, he gives it to his neighbor, all right, and that neutralizes the pressure. Now they both they have half as much pressure. One has half more or whatever, the other guy has half less. Um and that's all that's happening. It has to have there has to be something that keeps pulling pressure out or everybody just gets pressurized and then nothing moves anymore. Um, but that's all that's happening. You have to have a drain for the electricity. Uh, yeah. Um, all right, so I don't know if that was the important subject. Okay, so the rest is, you know, a, a hunk of it was on this interferometer stuff. Oh, yeah, so I wanted to say that, yes, but the shortwave radio, the, the higher frequencies, clearly reflect off objects. So that's how they go halfway around the world. They don't travel line of sight. They reflect off the atmosphere and off the ground and off the atmosphere and off the ground and off the ground. So they bounce around quite a bit. That's why the signals were, you know, you always had to move your antenna into some kind of position to get a signal because who knows where it's bouncing from. Um, you know, who knows which direction had the better weather uh, for you to be able to receive the signal. Um, uh, precise direction. Uh, you know, I mean, you you know, you could point, like, say, if you were in Africa and you were trying to hear Britain or whatever, you could point right at Britain, but that might be a big mistake, you know, because there's all kinds of obstacles in the line of sight, and the actual signal will be reflecting off a bunch of crap going somewhere else that you actually could pick up. Or you might even turn your antenna backwards and pick it up off a mountain behind you, and you're picking up the reflection off the mountain, you know, that kind of crap. All right, um, all right, so, um, so as I pointed out, uh, actually I attempted to point out, but I just want to make clear on the interferometer that I'm not arguing the thing can't work at all. I'm arguing that it works very differently than how they think it works. And I keep pointing out how important the, 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 the fact is, is that this divergence of light over a distance, so you can just sort of understand how you can use that as a way of measuring distance. So if something spreads over distance, all right, then this quantity will tell you this quantity. 
all right because they're linearly proportional okay the two the two things are now proportionally tied to each other the spread is exactly proportional to the distance you travel and so we see this all over the place but you know especially like in the two slit experiment if I put the target really close to the two slits theoretically the same exact patterns there but I can't see it it's too small right and if I want to make it bigger well then I project it at a further distance because the divergence will essentially create magnification and so that's what you're sort of doing with the interferometer is you're magnifying an effect over distance and the longer the distance the more magnification you're getting so the more detail you'll be able to see and that's sort of why interferometers work by creating greater distances you get higher precision um, <clears throat> and um, yeah so I, so I just wanted to understood that's why that's what I'm saying the theory of the interferometer is the theory isn't that you have you know this stupid um, exclusively uh, this this idea of a um, you know a wave interference kind of stuff and that that's uh, you're, you're measuring the these uh, phase differences I'm not saying the phase differences don't happen but the phase differences are not phase differences okay the thing you're seeing isn't a phase of the light that's making the difference between where the ring is where the ring is is dependent on where the, this distance so you can sort of understand that let's say you're projecting a picture of Donald Duck on the screen or something and his beak is right there now if I make the screen if I push the screen back further the beak won't be in the same location anymore the whole image has gotten bigger and the beak is now in a different position and a similar thing is happening in the interferometer as you change the distance you're changing what ring is on and off because all the rings are changing their position and the key to it is is the ring um, the divergence of the the rings is a different divergence than the divergence of the light that creates them so there's two there's two mechanisms so the rings appear not to be changing size but they really they're just filtering the bigger image that's behind them that's that is changing size so it's like you having a confined if I, if I confine the the picture of Donald Duck and I put a, a screen around it so you can't see stuff that's that goes further out then you could sort of realize that as you zoom as, as I move the distance if I move the projector back or I move the screen further away that certain parts of the image will get change in here but here it won't get any bigger because I've amassed the screen this is all you can see and that's a key function of interferometers is it's a mask okay um, they often use a lens for that purpose um, and it's always projected like I said the projector you're never moving the screen you're moving the stuff behind it so you know which is a key difference so anyway um, all right and so the, the mechanism for this is another thing to be understood so this <coughs> so I did look so uh, the Sanyak or whatever it's called um, interferometer I did look up some videos on it unfortunately you know there's none like the nice 1960s 50s videos you know they explain stuff that, you know there's none of that um, they're all kind of messy a little complicated um, you have to trust the guy kind of stuff um, and a ton of them are being made by people who want to prove the earth is flat and uh, you know they want to prove ether because they think God made ether some kind of crap like that so a lot of people with religious and motivations a lot of it's just unfortunate that the, how, how dirty you know it gets um, but it is sort of they have sort of a, an argument to make that it seems like Einstein just sort of ignored you know you know everybody paid attention to Mickelson Morley and everybody ignored uh, this this Sanyak thing um, so it is a little bit strange why one got so much attention and the other got none of, no attention um, kind of a glaring omission uh, in my opinion <laughs> um, a, a glaring oh there they go again yes you know playing their little games um, all right but clearly I uh, as you know as I've already pointed out I don't think there's any hope that the experiment can th even theoretically work because first the two beams aren't going through the same amount of glass and second um, 
uh, one of the beams never goes through the little holes in the half silvered mirror. One goes through it both times. One gets diverged twice. The other beam only gets diverged once. So again, it's kind of these are sort of really, you know, they're sort of important detail. So the idea is this: there's a piece of glass and you have half silvering on it. All right, as I pointed out, there's really three layers here. Because you have the two surfaces of glass, then you have the half silvering. And the problem is, is that obviously when you say this is a 50-50 beam splitter, <coughs> um, it really can't be. And then you say it's half silvered because you know some of the light's going to reflect off the glass. So some of the light's reflecting off the glass surfaces and it doesn't have anything to do with how much silver is on the back. It's, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's reflecting off the glass. And at a 90 degree angle coming in, that percentage will average out to 8%, but clearly how thick the glass is can increase or decrease it. So if you polish the glass, you might be able to get down to 0% actually, which is, you know, and you can get up to 16% of the light being reflected by the glass, just dependent on how thick the glass is. Um, just the irregularities in the glass's thickness. So that this is all part of the stuff where you know there's a lot of precision to all this stuff, and obviously they don't pay any attention to any of these details I'm pointing out. So they just uh, theoretically measure it in some way and say it's 50-50, but it's clearly the the half silvering can't be half silvering. Um, it just ain't going to work um, <coughs> because it's going to be a rather substantial percentage of the glass because you're coming in at a 45 degree angle it means these numbers go up I mean 16 percent becomes 32 percent or something it's a much higher percentage the the more you increase the angle the more likelihood there is of reflection um, so this doesn't make much sense and as I pointed out it almost looks 50 50 from my own perception anyway frankly when I shined a laser into just a plain piece of glass you got two very substantial. Both beams were pretty substantial. Looked pretty 50-50 to me. Maybe it wasn't 50-50. I didn't even need the half silvering. Okay. Uh, but what I also found out is I can also I can create the pattern even without the half silvering just by having dirt on the glass, moisture on the glass, and it'll create the same effect um, as the half silvering in the sense that it'll do the light diverging, which is really the only thing the whole experiment's about. So the point really is, is as I pointed out, the real suspect in this pattern, okay, so the pattern we're looking for is this idea of a, a circular pattern of on and off rings. Um, and <coughs> so, you know, this is off, let's say, and then this would be off, and then this would be off, and they, they rotate. That is, the center goes on, then this ring goes on, and that ring goes on. So they're, they're just, an, it's an alternating Whatever this one is, the the even numbers are all on on on, or they're all off off off. So it's it's like two bullseyes, one turns on, one turns off on top of each other. You know, some kind of idea like that. And they think those changes represent some portion of a wavelength of a light. So they don't even think it's a true wavelength of light. They think every change is some portion of a wavelength of light, which is you know really. Uh, thinking they're measuring awful small distances. Um, so what I would argue is that what's a, a real suspect for creating this pattern, as I found out with my own experiments, is the idea that <clears throat> when you put this dirt on the surface, or you put this half silvering, um, what's going to happen is the light is going to spread. And because, and the smaller, the smaller you make the hole, the wider these angles get. So you're more and more guaranteed, okay, not to have a photon going straight through the smaller the hole. So the smaller the hole, less chance of a, a straight photon and more chance of a very eccentric photon. So that's a key to this whole thing. So you can sort of understand that if light goes this way through, all right, and it goes through this little diverging thing here, well, that light will diverge here, but obviously the stuff that has an eccentric angle won't still be in the experiment so it's it's going to be lost the experiment won't be able to contain it it'll go as it as it travels it will miss the mirror over here it's supposed to reflect on so if it's diverging too much it misses the mirror and it's out of the experiment and you really see that in the real world um, in the sense that uh, <laughs> yeah you see it in the real world uh, um, in the sense that 
this pattern is always pretty dull by the time you get through the whole experiment. You don't have much light here still. Um, part of that is, is because 50% of your light is going out of the experiment through the other mirror, but the other part of it is it's a lot less than 50%. So, so going through the mirror one way um, is, you know, going through the half silvering this way. All right, will create divergence, but it won't be as significant because any of the really eccentric lines are going to get wiped right out um, because they're not going to hit the other mirror to return. Okay, but if you go through this way, then the light spreads into the glass. And this is a key thing. So if you have little tiny holes and the light's diverging a lot, you're guaranteeing internal reflections in the glass. Okay, it's just, it's a fact. And there's a certain percentage of the light uh, at each one of these points. So at each point of reflection, there's a percentage that the light goes through or it reflects. So whether it's 10% or 20%, but it happens each time it hits the surface, there's a percentage chance that it escapes. And you can sort of see that these escape lines could very easily okay, mimic, uh, look like, uh, seem to be. And I don't like those words, right? That's, this, this shouldn't decide it just because it looks like. But clearly, it does look like, okay, you can clearly see how those reflections would... Um, create the, the pattern and that yes you need to be a certain distance away to see the pattern but it would be pretty strong divergence so you don't need much distance and the internal reflections in the glass are what's really creating the rings and I think I demonstrated that like I said on my porch by the fact that I just used dirt and the fact is is when the light was going through the dirt surface first and then into the glass you got the pattern and if it was going the opposite way, you didn't get the pattern. So um, I think that's the viable explanation for the source. This is an optics experiment, you know, uh, you know, most, you know, in almost entirely, and they're making it into a quantum mechanical thing when it's it's an optical thing, and the optics can be followed. The photons can be understood. They can be followed. They can be traced. They can be drawn. You don't need to do this interference crap. There's a mechanical explanation for the pattern. Um, and it's being caused by diverging light and um, changing distances magnifies images, okay? Which allows you to, see, it's like a microscope. It allows you to see things. But you're not seeing a transition in sub wavelengths of photons. It's not nearly that sensitive. Um, okay, uh, let's see if there was any other elements of that conversation I wanted to say more on. All right, so what I had thought of uh, was an experiment I like to see done is do away with the glass because the glass is just getting in the way. Uh, it, it's just um, Yes, it can create this internal reflection problem that could confuse. <laughs> so, um, be more interesting to see if they could make a filter, you know, out of a very flat piece of chrome or whatever, and just um, carve little holes in it, you know, like a screen. So it's a perfect mirror, except you know, finish, except you've cut out pieces of it. So now there's holes in it. And the holes will be a little bit bigger, so you'll have less. You'll still have divergence. You'll just have less of it. But you really will have a, a clean beam splitter in that it'll really have to be 50/50. That is 50/50, um, you know, material and and 50/50 empty spaces, um, because that's going to dictate the light will either reflect or you'll hit one of the holes. You'll you'll hit the metal. You'll hit the hole hit the metal, hit the hole. So just a bunch of holes would obviously be easier to do. Just a really fine screen with a bunch of little holes in it. Um, and then you can make a pure 50-50 filter that way and now you won't have this idea of internal reflections in the glass and you won't have the idea of reflections off the glass which are a problem. So you get rid of those two problems and so then all your your results will be a much more um, fact-based on what happens when you actually create two 
more equal beams of light. See so if two more equal beams of light can produce the same results, or similar results, or produce the pattern at all. I mean, I would argue if you can create the pattern with this at all, any kind of roundish looking pattern, um, then at least you've eliminated the glass internal reflection as being the primary cause. Okay. All right. Uh, I know there's a couple of other interest subjects I talked about, but uh, they're not occurring to me at the moment, so I'll do the last little bit that I intended to do. Um, I guess I can use the bottom of this paper if I need it. All right, which is this? Oh, I can do that. I've got the right mouse. Well, maybe I'll take a little break. Might be the way to go. All right, just a, another subject that came to mind. Something I thought about was, um, uh, whatever, those guys that, I used to have TV years and years ago, and there was two guys that do a bunch of weird experiments, see if they can bend bullets or do some other kind of crap. And uh, so they had an episode where they wanted to do the, the trick with the basketball where, you know, you throw a basketball off the back of a truck that's moving, and you throw it at exactly the right speed so the basketball just falls straight down. <clears throat> so they made a cannon, you know, a basketball cannon and all that kind of crap. And they finally succeeded in having the two velocities exactly the same. So even though you fired it out of a cannon using energy, the basketball was just hanging in the air and went straight down. Um, <clears throat> and that's sort of a, the point I'm trying to make about when we're talking about what light's doing, okay, when you're moving an object and the emitter's moving and the receiver's moving. It's the same kind of effect. So if you think about what photons are doing, let's say photons have a certain amount of cannon energy to shoot a photon. Well, that cannon energy, all right, isn't going to be enough energy, obviously, to create a photon. If they have energy going in the opposite direction, it's going to diminish their amount of energy, right? So if I, if I have the truck going 50 miles an hour, I need a certain cannon to shoot a photon. But if I move in the truck 70 miles an hour and I keep the cannon that's only shooting, you know, 50 miles an hour, then we know that the photon isn't necessarily going to get launched at the same speed relative to. Um, and I don't mean that the photon has a different speed. I just mean it's going to have a different starting point inside of the thing it's, it's being launched from. If, um, so I'm just using it as a, it's a poor analogy just because we know photons aren't released. <coughs> photons are released, okay? They're, they're already moving like a flying bird. They're already flying. And you're really releasing something that already has a set amount of energy. But the point clearly is, is that set amount of energy is going to, <coughs> is going to be able to get, <laughs> it's, going, it's going to have, its release point becomes more and more important the faster something's moving in terms of it's going to be part of the equation of you can't just say this is where the bird started flying is the back of the truck now the bird started flying much further inside the back of the truck and that distance is going to matter more and more the faster and faster you're going so it's still a very subtle argument but it's it's one they just totally discount like they pretend they know how photons are made and they know how um, they know what the the, the fact that it takes the same amount of time for the energy to be released no matter what speed you're going and that seems people should be agreeable that that would be kind of an, uh, a nonsensical expectation that it clearly is going to take longer because you have to apply more force to overcome the force that you're moving before you can do the photon thing I mean you first have to make up for the force you're going in the wrong direction before you can release the photon in the right direction. So if you're going 90 miles an hour this way, the point is, is you sort of have to throw against the 90 miles an hour first to be able to actually throw a baseball 50 miles an hour. So if I want somebody on the ground to see the baseball moving 50 miles an hour and the truck I'm on is moving 90 miles an hour in the wrong direction, I have to actually throw the baseball 140 miles an hour. And obviously that's going to take a lot more energy to throw at 140 miles an hour. It's that kind of argument. All right. So I was thinking about this um, this old experiment that's really nice because you get to see what's happening. 
uh, but you don't see everything, of course. Uh, so it's the electron um, in the magnetic field. And as pointed out, the magnetic field is even throughout. And I probably should just illustrate that point just because to make it clear. So just imagine there's two coils, and it's you know they're they're creating a whole field in here, and it's going to even. So you can sort of understand the coils creating energy in all directions equally towards us, this center of gravity. Oh, <laughs> drawing has to be visible. All right. So there's two coils, one here and one here. Just pretend it can be anywhere in that line. Um, <clears throat> now the point is, is that as I stated, it wouldn't matter. Like this center is just kind of an illusion because it doesn't matter where in here, it'll still create a center. In the sense that if I move this dot over, you can kind of understand that this is your new line, let's say. And you could sort of see that now this side coming from this direction, all of these vectors are now hitting where they weren't before, right? There's all kinds of places you can get hit from that you couldn't get hit from here. So when you were here, all these lines didn't hit you, so to speak. So this amount of energy never got to you. You only couldn't get energy from here. Now the energy you got was much closer, which means it was much stronger energy, but you got less of it. So you can sort of see that on this side, right? There's a lot less energy, but you're much closer to it, so you're, it's stronger. And those two things basically balance out. So if you were inside a hollow earth, the gravity would be the same no matter where you went because this effect. The closer you get to one surface, the more exposure you have to the other, and vice versa. And it's a very interesting truth. So that's what's happening to that electron gun inside that sphere, is it's in a world like that. Now, the question is, though, is if you had a hollow earth, but it was right next to a solid planet, okay, that was creating gravity, the fact is, is now you're not going to have this even world anymore. And you're going to end up feeling the gravity from this external body. And that gravity is going to move you in a direction inside the sphere. So the argument would be that um, inside this, this balanced field, you still have the problem that real gravity is coming down 10 meters per second per second. Now the trick is this electron's path through this whole circle is a millisecond, okay? It's, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, one hundred thousandth of a second. It's, it's some preposterously fast number. It's nowhere near the speed of light it's moving, but I'm just saying it's very fast. It's moving, you know, uh, whatever, 1%, 3%, 4% percent of the speed of light. It's moving pretty fast. So we're not going to see it moving unless these electrons really did stay in this loop for some amount of time. So they'd have to stay here for like a half second or something before we would actually see the movement. Well, a quarter of a second. Uh, 10 meters per second is pretty fast. You know, so it's a pretty good movement. So we should see something in, you know, if we had enough time. So the point is, is these electrons are clearly running out of gas fairly quickly. Um, they don't have much durability. Because they're not going around and around and around at the same speed. So she was quite explicit in saying velocity when they leave the gun. So she was counting the velocity when they leave the gun, and, and she wasn't pointing out that you know these things are slowing down um, as they're going around, and that eventually they get too slow to, to agitate the, the hydrogen or helium, hydrogen, hydrogen atoms, so they're not going to make light anymore. So as soon as they start to degrade in speed, a certain amount, they won't make a photon anymore, so you won't be able to see them. And so if they're falling, you don't see that loop falling um, from gravity. You don't see it sagging. Um, <clears throat> but I guess I would argue that if we could actually see that, that it would sag. And that, again, this, this experiment sort of indicates that the electrons don't have much durability because they don't go around and around and around and create more and more light. So there's no amplification of the amount of the number of photons being created. And theoretically, there should be an amplification if the electrons continue to go around and around and around. The point is they're really not doing that. 
they're decelerating rather rapidly and as they decelerate you know they're losing their speed and then they just curl into some spot in space uh, you know under one of the hydrogen atoms uh, and then eventually they have to you would argue um, be affected by gravity and there'd be more of them down here than there are up here so that would be the interesting thing to do is to put probes in here and see if there's more free electrons up here than there are down here because I guess theoretically there should be some slow, very slow moving electrons falling to the bottom of this vessel, theoretically. So it's just another way, you know, we say, gee, you wish you could, you know, do the experiment and play with it in these ways. Um, you know, but if all that takes energy, work, time, and who has it, and nobody cares, and physics is disinterested. It's not something universities waste any time doing. Experiments, <laughs> they really should be doing them. They only do it in one way, and that's it. Don't touch anything. Make it work, and then stop. You know, don't try to break it. And you know, it's just so unscientific. So that's what I really like about these some of these nutters. Okay, um, the people looking for the free energy and all that stuff is because they are willing to break things. They are willing to push it. They are willing to play with it. Now, whether they're willing to show you when the results don't look the way they want them to be, like the Ken Wheelers, for example who don't really explain what he knows about ferrocells, what he knows about how these LEDs are creating this image. And he doesn't go into any of that, doesn't show that to anybody, because he doesn't want them to see how the magic trick is done. Uh, yeah. So anyway, this was just another thought I had, another way to first demonstrate a consistency with my argument that electrons uh, decelerate, uh, that they don't have durable velocity uh, so you can give an electron velocity but it doesn't it's not going to hold it unless you keep pumping it with more energy um, because it just tends to decelerate and I would argue even in a vacuum so even if this was a vacuum the electrons would decelerate uh, and it's the only reason why it's not a vacuum is like it's, you know is so we can see the electrons. So you can't see them unless they, we force some of them, like a laser beam. You can't see a laser beam unless you put some dust or particles in the way so you can see the light going the wrong way. So unless we destroy some of the electrons, we can't see where the rest of the electrons are. Uh, okay, so I think that's all I had to say about that. So maybe there's enough subjects in this one video. I don't want to create too much confusion. Um, but yeah, these are all it's all interesting stuff in my opinion um, again you know in the seven years I've been doing this I've obviously when I started I had some notions that were wrong um, I haven't taken any of my videos down so clearly you can find some clips somewhere where I say something that's just fucking wrong and if you you think you win because you can mock me because in the past I said something wrong now even though I made a video yesterday making it clear what my opinion is you know go ahead and play the game but I'm just saying it's unfortunate that um, you aren't severely punished for that kind of behavior. It's it's just an unfortunate, um, um, huge um, fault. It's a fault of our civilization, um, you know, that we don't apply any consistent rules. You know, it's just disgusting in a way, right? I mean, I just I just saw a newspaper where somebody, somebody was pointing out a newspaper article that had two stories on it, so two cop stories, right? So one cop drunk drives, plows into a, a car, and breaks a guy's leg. Okay, another cop is a passenger in a car, driven by his friend who's drunk, and that cop gets killed in the accident. So the cop wasn't driving, but he was drunk and the, clearly the driver was drunk. So the, the driver's facing 20 years in prison for killing the cop when clearly he didn't want to kill him and clearly he wasn't any more drunk than the other cop. And the cop is facing no jail time, okay, just some community service crap and it's just whitewashed away. So they committed exactly the same crimes, right? I mean, they got into cars drunk. Neither, no one intended to do anything malicious, but they clearly did something insanely stupid and disrespectful to everybody else in the world, right? I mean, they're just basically saying, I'm going to go gambling with your life. 
and that's kind of a bullshit thing to do, and that should be punished. But it's stupid to say one guy's guilty of murder, right? I mean, this is the same dopey argument where we, we can't even as a civilization figure out that it doesn't matter whether I successfully kill you, right? If I attempt to kill you, isn't that the crime that I attempted to kill you? The fact that I sh didn't shoot straight and I didn't kill you means I don't go to jail for as long? So I get rewarded for being a bad shot? I mean, things that stupid, you know, we as a civilization should be able to say, no, that's just, that's just stupid. Let's fix that. That's stupid. You know, and the fact that we allow trolls to win, okay, um, you know, people making superficial mocking arguments, telling a fucking joke. We let the joke tellers win. Um, and that's bad on us. Really bad on us. All right. Anyway, uh, well, we, you know, <laughs> well, they do, in a sense, win because uh, the simple-minded can't be bothered paying any attention to the detailed argument. Um, but that's you know, we see it. They make these science documentaries, all these flashy graphics, all this crap, and absolutely no f fucking substance, no evidence, no real evidence, just a bunch of babble. Uh, Alright, so that's enough of a commentary. Commentaries are a little dangerous. But I think that's it. I don't think this is... I keep thinking there was some other little subject that had <coughs> occurred to me and to somewhere it's gotten lost in all of this. But it'll no doubt occur to me again. Or maybe not. Yeah, I thought of that the other day. I said, well, well, you know, after I'm dead and these videos are sitting here, there are some things I should point out just to be sure that Oh yeah, I already thought of that, assholes. No, no, I, I Gary had thought of that. So there was a point I wanted. Like the, ultimately in the universe, <clears throat> this whole red and black force thing. The force is probably a very much like a very, um, you know, geometric. Uh, you know, it's just full of the same stuff. And you know, frankly, when there's a frequency of light, um, it might very well be true that it's just a an amount of um, one form of the energy versus the other. So it's just you're just changing the, the mixture, the proportions of how much red there is to black. So the higher frequency would have, you know, more of the little uh, dots would be black and less of them would be red. Um, because the reds are sort of irrelevant to the electron. And all we're really doing here with the electromagnetic spectrum is affecting electrons. They're the things the spectrum can get to. They're the things the spectrum can hit. Um, and the protons are sort of irrelevant because even if you hit them, they don't go anywhere important. And they're also not, they're not as the electrons are, they're not held in tension against each other because of the fact that they're in a nucleus with another electron. Everything's really compact. So they don't have the same ability to have the same effect. They're not magnifying the effect by having the effect over a bigger scale, right? The electrons are doing this, where the protons is doing this. So it's sort of like the sun's procession. See, that's another subject, right? Because it can be argued that the sun's procession is all Einstein's math is really getting to. So the sun is wobbling, uh, you know, as it, the, the center of the sun is actually wobbling in its orbit. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it processes, it's, it's turning, <laughs> you know, funny. Um, and yeah, the, the closest planet would feel that. Oh, Jesus, I'm going to have the drawing on again. Uh, I don't really need it, I don't think, but obviously this procession drawing wasn't very well done. But the, the fact is the sun, so the sun's moving in this area. And so obviously the, the, the uh, planet that's really close is going to, be able to detect that movement uh, because it's a bigger movement by percentage of distance. But the further away you get, the other planets, the less that tiny bit of movement makes any difference to the distance, the total distance. You know, so where it might be 2% of the total difference for Mercury, it's only going to be, <coughs> you know, one two thousandth or twenty thousandths of a percent for the Earth and, you know, uh, than the further planets. So this procession means nothing to these planets, so it doesn't affect their orbit at all, where the close planet's going to be affected by the fact that the Sun 
the sun's center of gravity <coughs> is moving because yeah every time the sun the all the motion the earth the earth creates towards the sun all the movement the sun the earth's doing towards the sun the sun is also moving the same amount of earth distance towards the earth so there's a mass inside the sun that actually moves now the sun's huge one million times the size of the earth so obviously that one little one millionth of the sun moving isn't going to be noticed but obviously that movement is going to change the precession of the sun so all the planets are tugging on the sun the sun is wobbling in the space and that wobble is causing mercury to wobble now that's you know it's a simple explanation uh, you don't have to bend time bend time and space you don't have to create time dilations and all this other kind of crap you know you can just say yeah that makes sense Maybe it's not the right answer, but I'm just saying it's a possible candidate for the right answer. And the truth is, is uh, so few people understand Einstein's field equations that they have to argue about it. The people who sort of understand or can even do the equations, I've never even seen the equations actually done for Mercury's procession. Um, but let's say, you know, I've seen them arguing over what exactly is in the equation. <laughs> and this very fact that it could just be that it's just measuring where the sun's gra center of gravity is. All right, so anyway. Uh, but people are just so confident. Oh, we have the right answer. We don't need to think about it. It's done, uh, you know, and again, on just sh shreds of evidence, just slivers of them. Nothing, nothing hard, nothing decisive. Uh, a lot of conclusions just based on um, glancing blows all right so that's enough now I think we're recording yeah appears to be all right so till the next time and such